Hi everyone, I want to welcome you to the Town of North Hempstead Sustainable Yard Care Workshop. My name is Megan Festuca. Um, I'm an environmental specialist with the Town of North Hempstead. I work in our Department of Planning and Environmental Protection, uh, mostly on sustainability projects. Um, and I would also like to introduce Bonnie Klein, who is the town's horticulturist. Bonnie and I will jointly be giving tonight's workshop, and we really want to thank you all so much for joining us this evening and taking time out of everyone's busy schedules. Um, so Bonnie, it would be great if you could just tell everyone a little bit about yourself as well. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am the um, horticulturist for the town of North Hempstead. I'm based out of Clark Botanic Garden. And um, I work on mostly all the parks in uh, the town of North Hempstead. Great, thanks, Bonnie. Um, before we start, I just want to uh, remind you that you've been muted. So if you have any questions for us during the presentation, you can type them into the chat box at any time. And then we're going to pause at a couple of different intervals throughout the presentation to answer them. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, to get to the chat feature, usually you can hover your mouse at the bottom of the, of the screen or above the screen, depending on where your little bar is. Um, and then you should be able to click chat. It'll bring up the side panel and then you can type your questions in there. And then also we will be recording this workshop, as you probably heard when you came on. Um, it will be posted on the town's website so that you can watch it again if you miss anything. So don't feel like you need to take, you know, copious notes during the presentation. Um, and or we'll also uh, ask you if you'd like to pass it along to anyone who may have missed it or is interested as well. So... First, um, let's review the goals of sustainable yard care. Um, they include reducing or eliminating inputs like water, chemicals, and maintenance practices, protecting our natural resources like soil, our air, and our water, providing benefits for humans, as well as creating a habitable area for wildlife, and promoting ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, stormwater capture, pollution absorption, and climate moderation. So one way we can serve our natural resources is to protect Long Island's water. Um, Long Island gets all of its potable, including drinking water, from underground aquifers. Um, and we often overpump the, this water during the summer months for irrigation, which puts a strain on the aquifer. It also pulls pollutants deeper and deeper into the aquifer, thereby having to pump water from deeper layers to get clean water. And it also causes saltwater intrusion from adjacent bodies of water. So if you look at this picture on the left, I hope you can see my little red laser pointer. Um, you can see that this is Long Island. We live on top of where our, we get our water from. So it's important that we're very mindful of what we're putting into and on top of the ground. And then we're also surrounded by many surface water bodies as well. So water coming off of our roofs, streets, lawns can transport different things like pesticides, fertilizers, oil, and other pollutants into storm drains and right into our local bays and estuaries. And these pollutants also can go into the aquifers as well. And many of our local bays and harbors are already plagued by nitrogen pollution, um, coming in part from fertilizers, which, which cause algal blooms and eventually dead zones and fish kills. So another goal is to provide for and conserve wildlife. Uh, much of the original habitat for wildlife on Long Island has been lost to development. And most of the vegetated areas we have now do not support our native wildlife. For example, large lawn grass areas or, or you know, landscapes that we have with non-native vegetation. Um, and our use of chemicals like insecticides hurt pollinator populations as well as other beneficial insects. Uh, really only less than 2% of the insects are considered pests. So, you know, there's way more insects that are beneficial to us than ones that are hurting us. Um, also, inse insecticides will kill insects that are food for most birds and other wildlife as well, just like this little garter snake that was in my backyard. Herbicides also cause neg negative effects for insects and other wildlife as well as kill the plants. Um, like host plants for butterflies and moths. So like this monarch butterfly, which needs milkweed to reproduce. 
Um, we all want our great yard that we can look at and, and it's beautiful and we can do that with sustainable yard care as well by working with nature instead of against it. Um, we can use it to reduce our own costs and maintenance. We can create green spaces on our properties to enjoy. And also it's been shown that being in nature can improve human health and well-being. So having a sustainable landscape starts with the soil. Um, it's important that we create a healthy soil ecosystem that humans and wildlife can depend on. Um, soil isn't just dirt. Uh, it contains many living organisms that play an important role in the ecosystem. So if we have healthy soils, they will absorb rainfall and mitigate flooding, remove pollutants from stormwater, they'll store water for plants, wildlife, and people, they'll provide habitat for plants and animals, and they'll also store carbon dioxide. So let's talk about composting. Um, it's it's basically the breakdown of organic materials by these decomposers that are within the soil. Um, and the, it's with the use of oxygen. So it creates a nutrient rich soil amendment and we can use that in our yards and gardens. Um, this happens naturally it, on, you know, in natural environments as well. And what's the breakdown of these materials is called humus actually. So you're basically create, using you know, a system to create that yourself so that you can use these nutrients for your soil and plants. So you can see from this um, graphic that there's many different types of composers, decomposers like bacteria, fungi, insects, snails, centipedes, worms, all these things that make up um, the soil that, and a lot of them will be in your compost helping to break down these materials. And compost is great. It provides nutrients for, for the plants and organisms living in the soil. It attracts things like earthworms and beneficial insects. It reduces the waste that ends up in landfills and combustion facilities, thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions from wasted food. It reduces or even eliminates the needs for fertilizers. It can definitely improve your soil texture and it can regulate the pH of your soil um, by thereby improving the ability of plants to take in nutrients. So there's many types of compost systems. Um, many people that don't have a lot of property like to use bins. They're an enclosed system and can be useful to save space. Um, this bin is called a tumbler. It's actually the one that the town sells. It's called a Compost Wizard Junior. Um, we sell it for $50 and there'll be more info at the end of the presentation about how we, you can get one of those this year. So it basically contains this cylindrical drum it spins on a base. This base has wheels, so um, it helps to save space. It keeps it neat. Uh, it has a lid so that it keeps animals out as well. There's also bins like this. You can make something like this out of a garbage can by putting holes in it um, out of plastic or metal. And then there's also a different type of composting called bokashi composting. It's called bokashi fermentation. Um, it, this is what it looks like when you're putting things in. It's actually a method that does not use oxygen, but you put your food scraps in a bucket. It, actually, you keep it inside. And this is helpful, really helpful for people who maybe live in an apartment or they just don't have the space for a bin like this outside. And you can find more information on how to do this on um, Rewild Long Island's website. Um, there's also piles. So if you don't want to use a bin and you want a bigger pile so you can put more food scraps in and yard scraps in, um, you can you can just create a pile. It's, it's easier um, just because you don't have to worry about having to, you know, have that smaller space. And you can also get hotter temperatures in a bigger pile, which helps materials break down faster. However, it may be harder to turn something like that. Um, one thing you can do is get a compost crank, this tool here. I have one of these at my house. Um, you just basically stick it straight into the pile, twist it, and then pull it up to mix the compost. So you don't have to use a pitchfork or a shovel. It makes things a lot easier. 
Um, and there's also many other types and ways to compost as well. I recommend um, looking, if you really want to get into details about composting, looking at the New York City Master Composter Manual. It's a really great resource. I have a link to it on the town's website as well. So what to put in comp your compost? Um, compost needs a balance of carbon and nitrogen rich materials. Um, all organic matter contains these elements. Some are just more rich in nitrogen and some are more rich in carbon. Um, carbon rich materials are known as browns. And you can see from this graphic, that's things like dried materials, dried leaves, wood chips, um, sawdust, corn cobs, eggshells, newspaper and cardboard and dried grass clippings and dried gardening trimmings. And then nitrogen rich uh, materials are known as greens. So that would be anything from this side where you have basically your fresh fruit and vegetable scraps and peels, coffee and tea, uh, fresh garden trimmings, fresh um, grass clippings, and even manures from certain animals like horses and rabbits. Um, a good rule of thumb is to add two parts browns to every one part greens to have that good mixture. Um, if you add too many greens, you'll probably be able to tell because there'll be too much nitrogen, which makes ammonia, and your compost will probably have a bad smell. It could become slimy, and just you need to add some more drier browns to counteract this. And then if you have too many browns, um, the organisms will slow down, temperatures will be low, and decomposition won't happen very quickly. So you can add more greens to counteract that. You shouldn't add meat, fish, or dairy. Um, this can lead to more insects or animals to be attracted to it, cause it to smell. Um, and usually small piles and bins that, that you have at your house, you won't be able to break these down very well. Um, you don't want to add colored paper like from magazines because the ink can be toxic. Um, you don't want to add pet waste from cats or dogs because they can have pathogens in them. Uh, but if you do have a rabbit like I do, you could add that to your pile. Um, and you don't want to add weeds because these plants can still go to seed in your compost pile. It's happened to me before. <laughs> and then you'll spread the weed seeds in your compost, which you don't want to do. Um, so another thing to add when you're first starting your compost bin or pile um, is a scoop of soil from your yard. And um, this helps to add, they say it helps to inoculate the compost. So it adds the microbes that are already in your soil to get the process of composting started. Um, when you're adding materials, it's best to break them up as small as you can. It, this increases their surface area and makes them more available to be broken down by the decomposers and um, be broken down more quickly. Um, as we said, oxygen is important in this process unless you're using Bokashi fermentation. Um, decomposers need this um, to break down the materials. It works aerobically, which means with oxygen. So you wanna mix and turn your compost a lot to incorporate oxygen. Um, if you have a bin, it should ha have holes in it. The one we sell has holes on the side so that oxygen is always being, you know, there's a way for the oxygen to get inside a bin like that. Um, another way to add it is by adding bulking agents, they say. So things, big things like wood chips or pine cones or corn cobs, just so it can, uh, you know, you have bigger things where oxygen can get around them and everything's not so condensed. Um, once you start making your compost, it can take anywhere from a few weeks to even a year or more to produce compost, depending on what, what you're putting in it, um, how small your materials are, and how, off, how often you're turning it and mixing it, the temperature of your compost, and the moisture content. And then once it's done, it should, you know, it shouldn't smell anymore. You should have like a, a nice soil-like texture. Um, it sh you shouldn't be able to recognize big pieces of anything that you, you're trying to break down. And then you can work it into your soil and you can also use it to top dress lawns or exposed soil. So now I'm gonna pause for questions. Um, let's see and anyone has any questions. I don't see anything in the chat yet, but please feel free to put anything in the chat. Um, and even if you have questions about the first part of the presentation um, later on, you think of something, we can always answer it later. So if there aren't any questions, 
I'm going to pass it. Oh, people have their hands raised. Can you please, anyone that has any questions, can you not use the chat or something? Is there, is there an issue using the chat or? We just ask everyone to put any questions in the chat. Bonnie, do you have any issues with the chat? You could put things in the chat, right? Well, I'm gonna try right now. Let's see. Tell me if you got it. Yep, I see your message. Okay, so it seems to be working. Um, okay, so please, if you have, if you do have any questions, please just put them in the chat and then we will answer them as they come. So I will pass it now to Bonnie um, and she's gonna uh, discuss how we can achieve our sustainable yard care goals using sustainable lawn care. Because I know many or most people have lawns in their yards. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, before we begin, we're going to talk a little lot, well, a lot about the biology of lawn, just so that you understand what the turf grass is. But um, before we begin, um, I just looked up um, what it, what a healthy lawn is, and a healthy lawn can prevent erosion by wind and water. It can improve flood control. It can help break down organic chemicals. It can help reduce noise. It can help to provide wildlife habitat. It can help create a cooling effect during warm weather. And of course, it can also help people who love just looking at the lawn, a visual appeal. Now, while I'm saying this, because there's a lot of um, back and forth about how either should you have a lawn or should you have some different type of ground cover, um, and some people do love, a lawn, love lawns. Now, uh, lawns, are, as far as I'm concerned, are great, but the problem that we have with lawns is the maintenance of the lawns. So the lawns can function, um, you know, as a as a good um, plant that soaks up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is a benefit. But it's many times outweighed by the association by the associated costs and the maintenance of all of these lawns. So that's what we're doing today is just trying to explain to you how you can maintain your lawn in a sustainable way so you don't um, have what we call like a carbon sink um, going on because of your lawns. So right here we have how does grass grow? A little bit about the uh, biology of grass. How does grass grow? Most of the lawns on Long Island right now are cool season grasses. Uh, we're not gonna talk too much about the uh, warm season grasses, which some of us do have, that's a zoysia grass. So we're gonna concentrate on cool se season grasses. And, and if we touch upon zoysia, or if you have any questions, just put it in the chat. So our cool season grasses, most of them are cool season. They grow best in the spring and in the fall, so coming up soon. And examples of those are the Kentucky bluegrass, the perennial ryegrass, our fine and our tall fescues. And this chart right here shows us how it starts to grow up, starts uh, the end of winter, beginning of spring, you see how it's growing up nice and tall. Then in summer, it starts to go into a dormant period because they're cool season grasses. They like that cold weather. And then again, in the fall, it starts to go up and then it goes down again in the winter. So our shoot growth and our root growth, they mirror each other um, in the spring and in the fall is when um, our grasses look its best and want to stay its best. Okay, next. All right, a little bit about fertilizing. So fertilizing healthy lawns in early spring just increases the top growth and also increases our mowing chores. We have to mow more when we fertilize in early spring. And that's in, at, the expense of, at, at the expense of the root growth. And what we mean by that is really in the early spring, you want the roots to grow deep into the profile of the soil and it grows nice and strong and it can withstand um, a lot of the heat that comes later on. 
And when you fertilize early in the spring, it just pushes more top growth and it, and it cuts off a lot of the roots. The roots don't grow as much, but the shoots grow higher. So um, the lush growth that you're getting in that spring, this is in our next um, bullet point, um, by fertilization makes the grass more susceptible to insect and disease early on in the season. So it might look good, but then come time summer, um, it starts to, uh, you know, we call it crap out. The plant, the, the turf grass starts to brown out a lot later on. So looking at this chart right here, you can see late winter, early spring, you have the, the roots are nice and deep. This is what you want it to look like. And the, the tops are just waking up and they're starting to grow. Then late spring, early summer, it sort of mimics each other. The top growth and the roots sort of look the same. They're at the same height. Um, late summer, early fall, you have a nice deep root system again. And the top growth sort of stays medium. And then when it starts to go dormant, both, both the top and the bottom will mirror each other again. So the roots, whatever you see on top, how, how high your root, your grass is, that's how deep your roots are. Next, please. All right, so springtime is a good time to seed and fertilize the bare spots. Not to seed and fertilize your entire lawn, but the bare spots in the lawn. Fall really is the best time to seed and earlier fall is, is, a, is a better time to fertilize. But right now when uh, spring is coming is the best time to, to um, find all the damage and, and seed and fertilize those spots. And to how to do that, here's our steps. One, you see your bare spot or your brown, where it's browned out a little bit, just loosen the soil. And you could also rip out any of the dead grass that's in there. You choose your seed, which we're gonna go over in the next slide. And then I mix one part seed with three parts of soil. You can use a top soil. You can even use some compost instead of soil. And then you just scatter that onto, the, onto that bare spot. And then you would water it in, try to keep it moist until you see the seeds coming up and starting to take. Next. Okay, what seed should I buy? So um, all of our properties are different there um, in different, um, some parts. So my, my front lawn is in the north where my back lawn is in the south. So a lot of these grass seeds um, do better in certain conditions. So right here you see, this is from Cornell um, University. Um, the first one is a sunny, medium to high maintenance lawn. So if you have a high maintenance lawn where you love Kentucky bluegrass, which some people do, um, this is the percentages. This is just um, a base. It doesn't have to be exact, but this is the percentages. You never want to go with a monoculture of all one type, because if you do, then um, you could get a disease or an insect. And if it hits your lawn, it'll take the whole lawn. So you want to have different um, varieties of grass within your lawn. And most of them are similar. They, they, are, um, they look similar when they're in a mix. Um, usually the growers mix the ones that look similar. So you won't have all different size grasses in, in one lawn. So a sunny to medium to high maintenance lawn would be 65% Kentucky blue, 15% perennial rye, 20% fine fescue. If you have a, um, a phone with you, you can take a picture of this. And when you're going to purchase seed, depending upon if you want a sunny or a high maintenance or a sunny low maintenance, or you need a shaded area, you can just look at this and um, see around the percentages. Doesn't Again, it doesn't have to be exact, but if it's close, um, this is the kind of a seed that you would want to go for, the percentages of seed. And it also tells you how many... So how do how many pounds per hundred uh, per thousand square feet to uh, to put down depending upon the size of your lawn? Okay, next and fertilizer. So fertilizer, all bags of fertilizer are labeled with three numbers. Um, and here's for example on this picture, here's uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now you're not gonna see the phosphorus anymore because um, uh, it's, they're not allowing that to be sold in our area. 
um, unless you're seeding a brand new lawn because of all the problems that it's leaching into our water table. So um, most of the time you see 21020, you're not gonna see the phosphorus in there. So these numbers represent the percentage of each element present in one pound of the product in that package, right? So um, knowing that, that this is not, it's you know, 50 pounds, this is 21% of nitrogen in a 51, 50 pound bag, okay? So here's the types, there's synthetic fertilizers, they're low in nitrogen, the slow release is recommended if you do synthetics. Uh, there's organic fertilizers um, and compost, also has um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium mostly in it. It has a lot in it. And, and then the mulch mowing also is a great way of not having to use fertilizer so it doesn't leach into our water. Uh, and uh, it gives back the nitrogen from the grass blades. There's the grass blades are water and nitrogen mostly. And if you mulch mow, um, they say, I think it was um, Cornell University said after about four to five years, you're putting back uh, as much nitrogen as you would as if you would put down like a pound um, of nitrogen per thousand square foot a couple times a year. So the mulch mowing just takes a little bit of time, but after you, if you continue to mulch mow, you're, uh, you don't have to use synthetics or any added nitrogen to your lawn. Next. Okay, so fertilization. On a healthy, well-established lawn, the recommendation for fertilizing home lawns on Long Island is one pound of nitrogen, not the product, to be spread over a thousand square feet at each of these two time applications. One application around Memorial Day, one application around Labor Day. Um, that's in order to keep the, uh, the grass, your turf grass healthy and looking good and it's feeding it. Um, now, again, if you're mulch mowing, you wouldn't have to do this. Um, and you can use organic fertilizers as well. Slow release fertilizers is great. Um, Nassau County has their uh, law. There's no fertilizing between November 15th and April 1st. That's because they, at, so, sort of at that time, the ground might be frozen or it's not absorbing anything or the, the, the grass itself is not utilizing it so that the um, fertilizer might be leaching. And Suffolk County, there's no fertilizer between November 1st and April 1st. Next. Soil testing. So one of the most important things to do before you even fertilize is to test the pH levels in your soil. If you um, test your pH levels and uh, turf grass or any kind of other, you know, uh, grass for your lawn, um, it, the level should be about 6.5. Um, if the level, if your pH level is not 6.5, then the, then the uh, grass blades are not pulling up this fertilizer that you're putting down. So then it's just going to leach away. So it's very important to try to test your soil. Um, you can do it at Cornell, uh, the cooperative extensions. You can do it probably at any nursery. You can purchase these kits. You only have to do it maybe once every couple of years just to check your pH level. It tells you if your soil is too acidic or too alkaline. And in order to raise it, if it's too acidic, you might add lime. Um, to lower it, usually um, you just don't put anything on it for a while and it should low. We mostly have low acidic soils. Um, on Long Island. Um, I wouldn't uh, suggest putting anything on your lawn too much to lower it because uh, some of the products that you use, if you don't use it correctly, is a little toxic and can burn your burn a lot of the, the grass. So um, on point number one, soil test monitor either plant nutrient levels and or pH levels. You could get a plant nutrient analysis. You can send away for that. Um, or uh, do not identify or measure insect population diseases, drain, drainage issues, pesticides, or other chemical levels. This test does not identify any of that. All, all the pH does is let you know if you need lime um, or if it's, if, you're, if it's too acid or too sweet. Uh, sometimes properties are too sweet or, or too alkaline because um, landscapers or homeowners 
assume every year that they need Lyme, so they just put it down without testing it. And they've been doing it for year after year after year, and they haven't tested their lawn. So um, I, we've tested properties where the levels are high, and then not, but without doing anything for a few years, it just lowers itself. Next. Mowing tips. This, this is like my favorite topic here because uh, I've seen this so, so often. Um, sharpen your mower blades. A dull mower blade can increase water loss, increase fuel use, increase opportunities for pests. We often see when a person's lawn's not looking good, um, and I just bend down and I'll pick a few blades, I can tell you right away, oh, you have a dull mower. Um, so it's such an easy thing. If, you, if you're not mowing your own lawns, um, to just ask you, you know, your landscaper um, to make sure his blades are sharpened. You know, sometimes that's difficult because you don't want to stop your landscaper because they're going from home to home to home. Um, I've always found that I text mine or I've uh, left a message and they appreciate that so much more than trying to stop them right when they're in the middle of doing their work. Um, but if it's your own blade, then uh, sharpen your own blade. If you're mowing your own lawn, just sharpen your blades. Uh, mulch mowing again, leave the clippings on the lawn. It provides nutrients and reduces water loss because again, those those blades of grass, has it's mostly water. That's what it's made from. Mostly water has a lot of nitrogen in it as well. Um, use real or electric battery powered mower, lower noise, pollution, and lowers maintenance. We use, at Clark Botanical Garden, we use a lot of um, battery operated um, mowers and blowers and weed whackers, and uh, they're, they're fantastic. And then uh, proper mowing height and proper mowing frequency, we're going to go over in the next slide. Next. So here's mowing heights and frequencies, which is also very important. Um, the um, sentence at the bottom, the best thing you can do for your turf is to maintain a three inch mowing height. That would be fantastic. It's difficult to do if you can get two and a half, two inches, that's excellent as well. Um, again, whatever you have see on top is mirror imaging the depths of your roots. Um, inside the soil profile. And when you have a nice, deep, healthy root system, you'll have beautiful, beautiful lawn on top. So um, if, you're, if you keep cutting your lawn and cutting it at a very low height, as soon as you cut it, the roots break off as well. Um, and then when the roots are so close to the surface, that's when insects, disease, you know, heat stress, cold, everything hits the turf, and then you get all these different diseases and insects. So the mowing height and the frequency, you don't have to mow once a week. Mow your lawn when it needs to be mowed. When the turf is higher, it um, crowds out weeds. It blocks the sun from hitting the bare soil so that the weed population doesn't take over as much as well. So the mowing height, having a higher mowing height will uh, really help out a lot. Next. Watering lawns. Don't water shallow and frequently on an established lawn. I'm going to go over that. Okay, so what does that mean? Watering shallow and frequently on an established lawn. Now I know that there's rules that uh, you water um, on the day, uh, the odd days, if your house number is on an odd number, then you, order, you water on an odd day. If it's an even number, you water on an even day. Well, that's the rules, I, I think it's Nassau County, um, that you can water, but that doesn't mean you have to water every other day. If we had a, a season like we did last year where it was dry all the time, then I could see it, that maybe you want to water every other day. Um, during a drought like that, it, it, when if we're allowed to water. Um, but um, it's way better to water deep and infrequently because that will bring the root system. The whole point is to get that root system looking deep into the profile and staying healthy within the soil. Um, and that will make your tops look just as pretty on top, you know, the tops meaning the you know, blades. So cre um, creating a shallow profile for soil moisture resulting in dry areas deep in the soil is what 
watering shallow and, and frequently does. It also stimulates weed seeds, it promotes disease and insects problems, and it causes surface crusting, moist and algae buildup in many shaded areas. So if you look at this picture, the deep and infrequent, you see a nice healthy top, you see a nice healthy root system. Then the second picture is deep. You're watering it deep, but you're watering it too often. So if you're watering it too often, you get a lot of root rot. So you don't have a lot of roots there. So the, when you don't have a lot of roots, again, the top mimics it. So you have less grass blades. And then if you're watering it shallow, very much to the surface, meaning a short amount of time, 15 minutes every other day, the roots stay at the surface and they always wait for the water and they don't go deep in the pro profile. So that's too often, you're watering it too often and um, not, not long enough. Next, please. So here's your best practices for watering lawns. Uh, one to one and a half inches of water per week for an established lawn. So you wanna test how much your, if you have a sprinkler system, you can test how much it's putting out. Everybody's system works a little bit differently. You can get a can, it's like the size of a tuna fish can or a cat food or dog food can. And you can put that a few of those cans out and turn on your system. And, and when that's filled, that's an inch and a half. So then you'll know it takes a half an hour to fill an inch and a half, you know, one, one of those cans. And so that you can use that to time your, um, your uh, irrigation system. So you wanna water deep and infrequent. Um, I water, uh, normally I would say, you know, everybody's different, but I water twice a week and I water for about an hour and a half, twice a week, that's it. So it, it always depends on uh, what your system puts out. So often most of needed water will be supplied by rain and you only have to supplement with the water. And sometimes you can let the, your turf go dormant in dry weather. This last season, if you let your turf go dormant when it was really, really dry, it doesn't die. It, the, the grass goes dormant and then it comes back as soon as the uh, nice rain start again. So it doesn't necessarily die. We, we're trying to force it to stay green through the whole summer, but it, it, cool season grasses wanna go dormant. Next. And weeds. So what is a weed? Um, a weed is defined as a plant growing in the wrong place. And that could be, uh, everybody has a different opinion on that, right? Um, the life cycle of a weed can determine how you might or might not want to control the weed. I'll explain that next. Next slide. Okay, so preventative weed practices. First, this is before um, we talk about um, knowing the life cycle of the weed. So first, try these options before resorting to any type of herbicides. When you're mowing high, as we discussed before, if you keep that your blades nice and high, that blocks the sun from getting to a lot of the weed seeds and they won't grow. Uh, reduce compaction. Uh, repair bare spots, compost and fertilize, and hand weed. So before you use any type of herbicides, whether it be organic herbicides or a synthetic herbicide, uh, we want to use cultural practices first. Next. So here's using our weeds as indicators. So if you have a lot of crabgrass or a lot of clover or any of these, pigweed, spurge, yarrow. Um, this means that your soil is too dry. And if you have nut sedge, which a lot of us did last year, um, creeping bent grass. Creeping bent grass is in a lot of lawns. People think they have grubs when they really do have creeping bent grass. Um, any of these other ones, buttercups, docks, plantains, then your soil is probably too wet or this poor drainage, or you have a leak in the system. So first you have to identify your weeds before you do anything else. Don't right away say, oh, I have so many weeds, let me go out and buy an herbicide to use to take care of it. Why do you have the weeds? Why are they there? Um, that's the most important thing to first identify why they're there. So identify your weed and then why they're there. And then maybe culturally you can correct that problem before resorting to any type of herbicide. 
Next. Leave the leaves. So um, you can use a mower to shred leaves and leave them on the lawn. So compost is fantastic. That's like, a, uh, that's a leaf compost. Um, we do that all the time at Clark. We um, shred the leaves with our mowers. We blow them out of the beds, we shred them, then we push them back into the beds, and then we blow the rest onto the lawns because it's nitrogen on those leaves. So it's great natural fertilizer. Um, it's a great mulch, as I just said, to use in garden beds, provides nutrients, helps prevent weeds when you have a nice mulch, and um, it's a great habitat for wildlife, especially in the winter. Next. And here's some more weed control. Uh, mulch is, is a great weed control. Um, we're going to start mulching probably in another week or two as soon as we get it. <laughs> we want to get a head start because we had such a, a mild winter. Um, we put down the mulch in a lot of our beds and that should help with a lot of the weeds. Um, mechanical removing using a whole rototiller cultivator mowing. Um, and you could use a torch too. I don't know what the rules are in Nassau County, um, but instead of using any kind of herbicide, these are um, these are great to choices. Hand pulling. Um, my staff is best. They know best about hand pulling weeds because I send them out all the time when they say they have nothing to do and they're pulling weeds. Us, all of our, our volunteers as well. Um, using plant diversity. Um, different types of plants can help with weed control. There are plants that help to suppress weeds. They have um, hormones that help to suppress weeds, such as catmint. We planted catmint all around our rose garden, and that is a suppressive ground cover. Um, so there's different types of plants that weeds don't like to be around. Um, and then a last resort is a chemical control. Um, but if you're going to use a chemical control, you must follow all the directions very carefully. The label is the law. So you can't ask somebody else, how should I use this? If it's not on the label, it's not legal to use it. So, and any kind of a um, um, product that you're making up yourself, it's not labeled, it's for use as pesticides. So you have to use whatever is on the label. You wanna choose the lowest toxicity, the most selective, the lowest residue and, or, and organic if you can, like a corn gluten meal. Next, insects and diseases. I know we're giving you a crash course in this really quick, but just gives you a little idea of what's going on and then you can look, look it up a little bit more. So insects and diseases. So many observed landscapes problems are not caused by insects and diseases. That's what people think first, okay, I must have grubs. And then they buy a grub control and they try to use it on their property. But most of the time it's not the case. So you wanna eliminate other factors first and use cultural practices. Next. So most diseases in turf is caused by fungi, and that's true. 25 fungi can, be, uh, can damage turf. Diseases only become noticeable when three to 5% of the turf is affected. So if only three or 5% of your lawn is affected by a disease, would you use a, an herbicide or synthetic herbicide to take care of that? That's a very small percentage. The fungi or fungus attacks turf plants because they're in a monoculture. So a lot of our, like if you have an all blue grass lawn, that's what the fungus loves because it's, in, it's a monoculture and it wants to take over. If you break that up and you have blue bluegrass, a little fescue, um, a little rye all mixed up, it, it breaks up that fungus and, and uh, it's much easier to control. Next. Pesticides and fertilizer applications. So here's our issue. You can even look at this picture, these two pictures. Um, one, improper spreader use. So in the first picture where it says no, um, when they're spreading, when, if you're using a pesticide or a fertilizer, it's going right into our water tables, going, it's running off and going right into the water. So it's better to use the correct one. It's a drop spreader on the, on the yes side. 
The timing of application is very, very important. You have to follow the directions and where, when it says a certain temperature, don't do it in the wind, you know, don't apply anything in the wind, follow the directions. Number three, watering it in. Follow the directions again. If it says water it in as soon as you apply it, water it in as soon as you apply it. It says water before you apply it, water before you apply it. Four, watch the weather. Five, your soil type. If you have sandy soils, very sandy soils, it uh, takes it faster. If you have a clay soil, it might sit on the top. And then if it rains the next day, it might leach out. You just want to be uh, cognizant of all of this. And number six, the solubility of the material. So you want to you want to use material that's going to um, be taken up quickly by you by the turf. Next. Okay, are there any questions? Great. I finally fixed the chat. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. For some reason, I don't know, it was not letting attendees chat. So I fixed the settings and we we're good now. So I can see there are some uh, questions in here, um, some related to the previous section. So I'll do those first. Um, so someone wants to know if uh, comp the composter aerator is supposedly very expensive in the market. So I, I'm assuming they mean the compost crank that I was talking about. Um, I didn't know that. I got mine a few years ago. Um, it, you don't have to have it. I mean, I like it just because I, I'm a small girl and it helps me to, uh, mix the compost more easily. But if you could use a pitchfork, if you, if you have a bin and you want to get a bin, that's like the, the, um, ones that I showed you that you can, you can turn it by itself, um, where you don't need to mix it with a, a tool, then that, you know, that's fine too. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure about where you could buy it at a more reasonable price, unfortunately. <laughs> um, um, someone asked if you can compost during the winter. Um, you definitely can. It's going to it's going to be a slower process during the winter because um, it, it's cold and there's not as much sun, so you're not getting things to speed up as much. But within the pile, it should stay quite warm. A lot of times, um, I put I put some compost in the other day on my pile, and I could see the steam coming off of it because it was still so warm inside, which was cool. Um. This one is for Bonnie about the um, watering lawns, I believe. They said, how do we know how often it is infrequent and how do we know how much time is deep? Oh, they said, never mind. Maybe you answered that question. <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't know if you want to go into it a little bit more. Or if um, Well, I think we went over um, one and a half inches per week is what's good. It's good for the lawn. And you, you'll notice it on your lawn too, your lawn, if your lawn needs it or not and you'll know by the temperature you know if it's really hot like 90 degrees for a full week you're going to water it a little more often um but if if on normal temperatures like in the spring if we're getting rainfall and um then you, you really only need an inch and a half per week on on an established healthy turf if your turf is not healthy and you're starting off with like nothing there <laughs> then you'll have to water a little bit more often Okay, great, thanks. Um, so someone wants to know, um, I think you mentioned using corn gluten for to control weeds. So maybe just a little bit more information about that. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of different products um, that have corn gluten in it. Corn gluten is, um, it, it's actually more of a fertilizer, a, an organic fertilizer. And what it does, it just, it increases the, the blades so it and it makes the, a lusher lawn so it blocks out some of the weeds and that was a study done actually from cornell because they they use it as a weed control and it is labeled as a weed control um uh, but it also works because it's corn gluten and the corn part of it has a lot of nitrogen in it and makes a healthy lawn so it, it, it acts as both um, and there's a lot of different nat um, organic products that you can use that have corn gluten in it Thank you. Um, do shrubs, trees, flowers, and bushes require same, the same watering as grass? No, they don't. And that's why um, when you have an irrigation system and you're watering your grass, 
with the same system that you're watering your shrubs and bushes and trees, sometimes you can have some issues because you're watering so often. A lot of times people are watering too often their lawn and then that's hitting all of your shrubs and bushes and trees which don't need it as much. Um, so it, it always depends on what you have. Um, and some plants take water uh, more than others. Some, plant, some plants like to be watered, uh, like plants that go into a rain garden, they like a lot of water and some uh, trees and plants do not. So you have to know first what trees and plants you have. They're not the same as watering a lawn. Nope. Thanks. Um, someone wants to know, can you use vinegar to kill weeds? 30% 30, 30 vinegar? So I cannot recommend that because it's not labeled for weed control. When you buy vinegar that you're cooking with, is there a label on it that says you can use this on, on your, uh, on your property outside? So I'm a, I'm a certified pesticide applicator and, um, in order to be certified, I follow the labels. So I, if I was going to use something, I would use something like, uh, burnout. Burnout is a, uh, vinegar based product and there's other products as well that you can use and it's labeled as a pesticide so the percentage of of uh, vinegar or whatever else they have in it is formulated and tested to use um, on your property that's the only things I would use only if it's labeled I cannot recommend making your own mixture and just so you know, the town cannot recommend any products. So that is just Bonnie's personal recommendation. <laughs> yeah, that's just like an example of something that's like that. But there's a lot of products um, like that. Right. Town can, well, I'm not recommending that product. It's just an example. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, is, is there anything special um, that they, someone who has zoysia, zoysia grass should do? Uh, zoysia grass should not be fertilized in the spring or in the fall. It's totally opposite. It likes to be fertilized in the middle of the summer. It's a um, warm season grass and it's dormant, as you can tell uh, right now. It might, might be warming up because it's, you know, we had a mild, mild winter, but um, it's dormant in the winter and dormant in the fall. And in the middle of the heat, it's, it's nice and lush. And that's when it's growing and that's when you want, want to fertilize it. It still gets a lot of same diseases as the other turf grass gets. Uh, it gets fungus and it gets um, other diseases. Um, but if you keep the plants healthy, if you keep the turf healthy, um, you should be fine. So fertilizing only in the, in the middle of the summer, not in the spring. That's what most of the problems most people have with zoysia. They fertilize it as a cool season grass and it's not. It's a warm season grass. Okay, great. Um, when is the best time of day to water? Um, so there's a lot of, I guess, myths about it. Sometimes people say the best time to do is in like, sort of like three o'clock in the morning uh, when it's going to um, hit your soil and then go through the profile. And then in the morning, you know, it's going to wash the dew is going to be like the sun's gonna sort of get the dew off the, the turf. I water as soon as I get home when it's most convenient <laughs> for me is when I do it. But depending upon your town, also depending upon the water pressure, um, you know, usually you have less water pressure middle of the night. Um, so you probably get, um, you know, a better flow of the water throughout your property. Um, you know, I don't have in-ground sprinklers. I won't use them. I like to water myself. So I do it when it's convenient. When I get home on the weekends, I might do it really early in the morning. Um, so, you know, it's really up to you. Yeah, I mean, you don't, the worst time to water is in the middle of the day when it's hottest. So watering it early in the morning before like 10 a.m. or after 6 or 7 p.m. is probably the best. So that it's cooler, the sun's gone down for the most part, and, and the water's not just going to evaporate as soon as it hits whatever you're watering. Right. Um, so someone wants to know when their the grass goes dormant in August, is it reasonable to ask the landscaper to come only every other week? And let me just say first before I go to Bonnie is I tried to do this and my landscaper basically told me no because they have, you know, they have a schedule and they have to keep to their schedule. So it probably depends on your landscaper, but I'll I'll let Bonnie, you know, answer if she has anything else. 
So um, when I, I worked over at Cornell Corporative Extension for many years and, and we had classes for landscapers and it's their business. Um, and if you're gonna start asking them to do that, it's gonna cut into their business. It's difficult for them to do that with anybody um, because um, they're somewhat underpaid to begin with. <laughs> That's my opinion, but um, you know, if you have a good landscaper. And so I, I think it's difficult for them to do that. Um, and every other week is a little long. So you might have to do it every 10 days or so. It's difficult. I tried many times in my landscaper to have them raise the mowing blade because they were cutting it too low. I, it, it didn't work. Um, so finally I was doing it myself. Um, and then Finally, I got somebody that seems to be listening, but I only have them for two years so far. <laughs> so I can't say, you can try. That's all I can say is you could try. Yeah, that, that's what happened to me. I just wound up doing it myself. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I couldn't get them to do all the things that I wanted. So I was like, I'll just do it myself. Um, okay, so someone wants to know about getting rid of zoysia. Um, they don't like it. So I don't, how would you get rid of that grass? Oh, good luck with that one. <laughs> um, so zoysia, it's difficult to get rid of. Um, you know, I don't like to recommend using too many pesticides or herbicides, but that's probably the only way you can do it is by using a, a, um, a, a, a non-select herbicide that kills the whole lawn. Zoysia, though, you know, any little piece of root that's still in there, it probably going to take a long time for you to get rid of it totally. Could you use something like a sod cutter or the, their roots deeper or something? Yeah, their roots are pretty deep mm -hmm. and anything that still stays there will just regrow. So, I mean, it, it depends if you have, if it's not a healthy zoysia and you can just keep trying to reseed it with a cool season grass, you, it's going to look funny for a while because you'll have the two together um, fighting that out. But if you keep reseeding with um, with a cool season grass every season, it's a little bit in the spring, a little bit in the fall, and your zoysia is still not doing well, um, there's a chance that the cool season grass will take over. I, that happened to me on the side of my property. My the, I had zoysia and didn't it wasn't healthy, and I, I kept reseeding it with a cool season grass. But often I overseeded. And uh, um, I finally don't have any more zoysia. It took a number of years. Otherwise, the only other thing would be a, an herbicide to kill okay. it. All. Thank you. Um, so someone said that watering depends on village ordinance and that yes, that's probably the case. It may not reflect exactly the best time, but usually villages and towns um, uh, have ordinances to try to save water. So it, yes. it'll usually be like, you know, af before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. or something like that. Yeah. So you yeah. can check with your village or, or the towns. I, th I think the town one is 10 before 10 and after 4, but I'm not sure. Okay, so thank you, Bonnie. That was great. Um, I'm going to move forward again. If you have any questions, continue now that we the chat works, you can continue to type them in the chat box. And at the end of the next section, we'll we can answer any more questions. Okay, so let's talk more about conserving water. Um, as, as I said before, uh, one of the goals of sustainable yard care is to lower inputs, like using potable water as, as we were talking about with lawns. Um, and as you can see from this graphic, as much as 50% of the water we use for outdoor irrigation um, can be wasted due to things like evaporation, leaks, sprinklers pointed at the wrong direction and runoff. So one thing we can do to save water is rainwater harvesting, which is basically collecting rainwater from something like your roof and then using it at a later time for irrigation. Um, it has many benefits like reducing the demand on the existing water supply, uh, as I previously spoke about the limited water in Long Island's aquifers. Um, it helps to reduce stormwater pollution because you're capturing that water off of your roof instead of letting it run off. Um, it helps you save money on potable water, and the rainwater is, is said to be good for plants, even better than um, the water coming from the tap because it doesn't have chlorine, which um, is said to inhibit plants from taking in nutrients. 
Um, a rain barrel is a very common system that you can use it at home. And it is, is usually a container like this one in the picture that uh, is around 50 gallons. So if you'd like to use a rain barrel, um, all of all rain barrels, there's many different kinds, but all of them should have these basic um, features. It should have a screen on top to prevent um, insects like mosquitoes and debris from getting into the water, but allow the water to pass through. It should have a spigot at the bottom so to drain the water. Um, it should have some kind of overflow valve, spout, or hose so that if the, the rain barrel fills up with water, it doesn't go into your house foundation. And then when you want to install it, you should place it underneath your gutter downspout in a location that's close to where you want to use the water um, so that it's easy access. Um, you want to, you may need to cut your gutter. So you see this one in the picture, how it's, you know, it's angled into the rain barrel. Usually a gutter downspout comes down to the ground. So you might have to cut it, possibly attach some kind of elbow piece like this and um, just direct it where it needs to go over the screen. Um, you want to put it up on cinder blocks or bricks or even a stand um, so that it'll increase the water pressure and allow a watering can to fit underneath. And then you will definitely want to make sure the foundation is stable wherever you put it because when it's filled, these things get pretty heavy. They can be, you know, hundreds of pounds and if it falls, you know, it's, it's dangerous. So this is the one the town sells. We sell them at the same time as we sell the composters that I was talking about before. It's great because it has a flat back, which saves space. Um, so it can go right up against your house. And I will provide some more information on how to purchase these at the end of the presentation. So the water you catch in your rain barrel should not be consumed by humans or pets. You should only be using it for irrigation. And we tell everyone to use caution um, when using any, any water coming from your roofs, just because um, for vegetable gardens, really, because of the chemicals that can leach from your rooftop materials. There's also could be bacteria from things like bird droppings, but um, you're free to use your judgment to decide, you know, what works best for you. And if you do decide to use the water on edible plants, just make sure you water the roots um, and wash anything thoroughly before eating. Another way to save water is by using water efficient irrigation um, paired with a rain barrel. So you can use something like a soaker hose as seen in this picture or drip irrigation. Um, they can be hooked up to the rain barrel spigot um, to provide water to a nearby garden. And soaker hoses, um, as you can see in the picture, they have very small pores all throughout the hose so that the water weeps out. And then a drip irrigation has evenly spaced holes and then you put them next to or plant your, whatever you're planting right next to it so that the water is goes right to where it's needed. Um, and these help save water because the water's directed right to the roots. So you're not spraying water with a sprinkler into the air um, and having it evaporate. Um, another way to save water is by regulating your automatic sprinkler systems. So automatic sprinkler systems, if you equip it with a soil moisture sensor or a rain sensor, um, these things really help because then you're not watering when it's raining or when the soil already has enough moisture for the plants. Um, and this, this is an example of a rain, an inside of a rain sensor right here. Uh, smart irrigation controllers are also really helpful. This is what one looks like. Um, they connect to the irrigation system, turn the system on and off um, automatically by monitoring the weather. So, and they can also connect to a rain and soil moisture sensor if you have them. If you live in Port Washington, the Port Washington Water District offers rebates for the purchase of these smart irrigation controllers. Um, they offer a $150 rebate. And also the town is a water sense partner and we recommend using any water sense labeled irrigation controllers to also help save water. And then there's also something probably you don't even realize is there called a sprinkler spray body, 
WaterSense has these certified as well. It's basically the external shell that connects the irrigation system pipe to, and it houses the, the nozzle that sprays the water. And these bodies, the WaterSense ones, they reduce unneeded water pressure and provide a uniform distribution of water. So this picture shows that there's nice even water coverage so that you're not having too much pressure and, and that leads to misting, fogging and un, uneven coverage and wasted water. So proper maintenance is also important for your sprinkler system. Make sure that the sprinkler heads are directed toward plants and not toward the sidewalk. I don't know how many times I've seen people watering the street and the sidewalk and not what they're supposed to be watering. Um, check for leaks and hoses and for broken sprinkler heads, replace those if needed, and then winterize by emptying the system of water and turning it off for the season. So um, I think Bonnie talked about mulch a little bit. Um, mulch is great to save water as well as suppressing weeds, so you get, you know, two benefits from it. Um, there's many different types. It's just based on preference. You can also, leaves are also a great mulch as Bonnie was talking about before. Um, it's, it, it suppresses weeds, so it's a natural alternative to using an herbicide, like a pre-emergent. And just when you do it on a, around trees, make sure you do not volcano mulch. This is not good. <laughs> um, it causes mulch to be on the trunk of the tree where moisture can get trapped and, and around the roots and then it can lead to fungus and rot. So this is how you want your, your mulch to look against your trees so that you have that space and the roots can get oxygen. So another way to save water is by replacing your lawn with less in water intensive or drought tolerant plants. So even, you know, if you do the right things, you're still, you still have to water your lawn if you want it to look green. But with these types of plants, you shouldn't have to water it, even possibly in a drought. And I, we recommend native plants. Um, these have lived and evolved over hundreds or even thousands of years in a particular region. They're adapted to our climate like dry summers and they can handle drought conditions. So there, there's plants that are Long Island natives. There's plants that are native to New York. There's plants that are native to North America. So what, what we try to do is stick to the plants that are as closest to our region that we can, because those are the plants that are from here. So you could have a North American native that's from California that's not really going to be native to our region. Another thing you could do um, if you really want a lawn um, is a no-mow grass or low-mow grass. Um, there, there are basically seed mixes out there um, that are labeled as such, sorry, and they um, they grow, they usually grow shorter than a normal lawn grass, so you don't have to mow them as much. They grow slower. They maybe top out at like six or eight inches, so you maybe only have to mow them like once a month or a couple times a year. Um, they require less inputs like fertilizer and water because they were designed to have deeper roots. And they're usually a mix of fine fescue grasses. So they work for like a full sun or partial shade location and they can tolerate moderate foot traffic. So you might not want to put it in a sports field, but if you're just using your backyard to, you know, walk back and forth across your property every now and then, that might be something you want to consider. That's a little bit lower maintenance than a regular lawn. And the pictures are some native ground covers so that you could use to replace lawn if you do have some areas where you don't need to be playing or, you know, walking a lot on it. This is Pennsylvania sedge. It, it actually looks very nice as, you know, a lawn replacement. Um, you have like the, the leaves grow and then they kind of weep over, which looks pretty. Um, this is called moss phlox. Um, this is actually my in the front of my house. <laughs> it it really looks it, it's a er, very early spring bloomer and it looks really beautiful as you can see with all the flowers blooming at once. And then this is a wild, wild strawberry. So it's a native strawberry. It it I have it in my backyard and it grows very quickly. So it, you know, it covers space easily. And then um, you get these nice white flowers in the spring. And then if the animals don't eat them, you can actually get edible strawberries, which is cool. 
So this is an example of something you could do. Um, you don't have to be so extreme and replace all of your lawn. You can just put maybe like a couple of gardens in, but this is actually my the front of my property. Um, a few years ago, I replaced it and this was what it looked like last summer. Um, I really didn't want, it was, you know, it's very hot and dry in the front of my house. I didn't want to keep having to water it. I don't have an automatic sprinkler system. So I wanted to lower the maintenance. I wanted to attract pollinators. I wanted to have, I know, I think, I think it looks nicer with pretty flowers than, you know, just one monoculture lawn. So um, you can, definitely look into doing something like this. Um, so since it's the front yard, I focused on creating um, a more formal grouping of plantings. So it wasn't, you know, creating some kind of meadow in my front yard. You can see that, you know, there's groups of plants so that it looks a little bit neater and more, um, you know, intentional. And, you know, the people that are used, not used to looking at this, that in my neighborhood, um, can can be more okay with it than if it was just some kind of wild, you know, meadow look. Um, and you're still getting the benefits of the native plants, but just having an aesthetic that's maybe a little bit more acceptable to those that, that don't really know about these kinds of plants. Um, I also have, you can't see them because they're kind of by my walkway, I have some signs that say pollinator habitat. So people can say, you know, if they're looking at it and they're like, why is this, you know, yard so different from everybody else's, they can see kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about native plants. Um, and there are many other benefits besides saving water, including climate moderation, carbon capture and storage, oxygen generation, wildlife and pollinator habitat, erosion control, stormwater capture, um, and also the purification and recharge of that stormwater as well for our aquifers. And you can see in this, this graphic, it describes a lot of the different benefits. So one benefit is the absorption of stormwater, um, which, it's been increased in recent years due to flooding and intense storms from climate change. Um, many native plants have very long root systems that create spaces in the soil, which then allows the soil to take in water. And these long root systems also help them to sequester carbon as well. So as you can see from this picture, this is Kentucky bluegrass. These roots only go down a few inches. And then you can see some of our native grasses like Indian grass, big blue stem, switchgrass, and little blue stem have these very long roots that go down uh, like eight to 10 feet or so. And also don't, um, don't forget about native trees, which are also great in helping to um, retain storm water and absorb it as well. Um, another benefit of native plants, again, is the lower inputs. Um, you don't need to fertilize these plants. They're adapted to our local soils. Uh, most only need to be watered until established or in long droughts. Um, it, like, it's very important to choose the right plant for the right conditions in your yard. If you choose some kind of plant that grows in swamps and you put it in a dry location in your yard, obviously you're going to have to water it more often. So choosing the right plant is, is extremely important as well. Um, it doesn't need to be mowed, so you, you have lower air and noise pollution and, and lower maintenance in that respect. Um, and most, most of these native plants are perennials or woody species, so you don't need to plant them every year. Um, they come back, <laughs> so it's less work for you and less money spent on plants or seed or anything like that. And then these plants are usually more resistant to native pests as well. They can tolerate more damage. And native plants are beautiful. Um, many people have these exotic plants in their yard. They, they just don't know about how beautiful many of the native plants are. So they're, um, they offer vibrant seasonal color changes, including fruit that some of them are edible to us, some are just edible to wildlife, so make sure you know that <laughs> before you uh, try eating anything. Um, some of these pictures that I have, this is a, called aromatic aster. It's a beautiful fall blooming aster. Um, this is columbine. It's a great 
pop of red and yellow color that blooms in the spring, uh, late spring, and um, it's pollinated by hummingbirds. So you try to attract those to your yard. And then here we have um, lobush blueberry. So it's a native blueberry. It, it has these little white um, bell-shaped flowers that are, are a good source of pollen and nectar for early um, bees that come out, like bumblebees. And then it produces um, berries that you can eat. Again, trying to keep them away from birds, but I've gotten some from mine and they're good. <laughs> These are some more pictures of, of beautiful plants, native plants. Um, we have, these are actually planted in some of the town's pollinator gardens. So here we have purple coneflower, which is being visited by a couple, couple of skipper butterflies. Um, this is mountain laurel, which is a really beautiful um, evergreen uh, shrub. I have them in my yard, I love them. Red chokeberry, um, garden phlox, this is a goldenrod, a great fall blooming species, um, anise hyssop, a nice mint, and then blazing star, which has some very interesting flowers. Um, so one of the best benefits for of native plants, I think, because I love wildlife, um, <laughs> is that they provide resources for wildlife. So they have they have nectar, they have pollen, they have seeds, leaves, fruits that feed birds, butterflies, bees, other insects, as well as mammals that live in our area. Um, pollinators and other wildlife, I think I said this before, but they've evolved with these plants. So they provide the nutrition and resources needed for them that exotic plants can't. Um, they provide cover to wildlife to rest during bad weather or to hide from predators. They provide nesting materials and habitat for bees, insects, and mammals. And um, they provide host plants for butterflies. Host plants are um, the, the plant that the butterfly needs to lay its eggs on for its larvae to eat. So a lot of some butterflies can be specialists on certain plant types. So the monarch butterfly is an example of this. It only eat, the larvae only eat milkweed plants. And oaks, cherries, and willow trees are host plants to actually the most species of butterflies and moths. So if you're looking to plant more trees in your yard, these provide great benefits for those species. Um, and they, this also, if you plant native plants, you're helping to reduce habitat fragmentation. So as I talked about before, much of, you know, the natural environment has been lost to development and it's been, there may be some out there, but it's very fragmented if you think about, you know, streets, houses, and everything that's in between. So if we can create areas with native habitat in our residential yards, in our businesses, in our parks and public spaces, we can help to connect this habitat for wildlife so they don't have to go so far in between. Um, so for the past two years, the town has received funding from the Nassau County Soil and Water Conservation District to offer town residents rebates um, to create native plantings in their yard. Um, in 2021, we, it was, we didn't have as much funding, so we create, there was 13 native plant gardens created, and then last year we had more funding, so we 31 people created plant um, native plantings in their yards. Um, and these pictures are just a couple examples of the beautiful plantings that you can do with the program. Um, we're very hopeful that we'll have this program again this year, so um, we'd be releasing the details in April. Um, it's for town of North Hempstead residents only, so I'm not sure if we have any people from some other areas, but I just want to make that clear. Um, you can email me, and like if you haven't already, I know a bunch of people have emailed me to um, contact them when we have the details. Hopefully, we'll get the funding. Um, but I, I'll have my email at the end of the presentation. So if you want to be put on the list to contact when we have those details, I can do that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about pollinator conservation because that's something that I work on a lot and is important to the town. Um, Native insects like bees, flies, butterflies, moths, beetles, and wasps are all pollinators. They, they play this role in pollinating a wide variety of flowering plants, including wildflowers, trees, garden plants, and cultivated crops. 
Um, bees are actually the best pollinators because they have hairs on their body um, in usually in specialized structures. Um, and they collect this pollen to feed their larvae. So when they're collecting it, they're actively transporting it to the other flowers that and thereby pollinating those plants. Most other pollinators, they're not, they're not collecting the pollen, so they're just kind of incidentally pollinating. Even though they do it and they're important as well, they're just not as, as good of pollinators as bees. And that would mostly be the female bees because they're the ones who are really collecting the pollen for their larvae. So most people think of honeybees when they think of bees. Um, these bees are actually not native to the U.S. They were brought here from Europe um, as a cultivated species. And while they are really important um, as livestock for our crops, we also have a lot of amazing native bee species that need our protection and our help. 90% um, of bee species are solitary, so they don't even live in a hive with other um, bees. They, they nest in the ground or they nest in cavities like wood or plant stems. Um, this leaf cutter bee here in this picture is a cavity nester. Um, while this bee called a uh, furrow bee, it's actually a type of sweat bee, um, they, they nest in the ground. Um, I'm sure everybody knows bumblebees. They are one of the colony nesters that we do have, but they don't have as large of numbers as honeybees. Um, and their, their nests usually have about 50 to 500 individual bees. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you may have heard that some native pollinator species have suffered population declines over the last few decades, like the rusty patched bumblebee. We used to have these here, but we they have not been seen in, in a long time. They are endangered now. Um, and the monarch butterfly, which was recently classified as endangered by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So these pictures, I, I described some of them already, but these are just a few pollinators that I found in the town's pollinator gardens. There's, there's so many more out there. You just have to get out there and look. Um, but I'll just talk about some of the other ones. So this is actually a fly. It kind of, it, it's a it's a bee mimic. So is this. It kind of looks like a bumblebee, but these both are flies. Um, it, the benefits of mimicking a bee are that um, you you look like you can sting. So they, you know, predators will stay away from you. This is also, this is a wasp mimic. It's a moth called a sphinx moth. Um, and then I just wanted to mention yellow jackets because people often get them confused with bees. Um, they they are probably the thing that if you get stung, you, it probably would be by this. <laughs> and it, it's that it's that annoying pest that, you know, is at your picnic or when you're trying to eat outside. The other thing that could it could be is possibly a honeybee because sometimes they get attracted to sweet drinks and things like that. Um, but wasps, even though somewhat annoying, this one yellow jacket species, um, wasps really are beneficial. They're they're also pollinators, as I said, um, and they won't usually bother you, the mo most of the rest of them, unless you bother them. They also, they feed insects to their larvae. So like bees feed um, pollen and nectar, wasps feed insects and, and other um, invertebrates. So they help to kill pests in our garden. So they're they're very beneficial to us. Um, if you're interested in seeing more of the native pollinators that I've seen and taken pictures of in the town's parks over the years, I created um, a slideshow that's on our website, and I'll, I can give you that link later. Um, I'm going to try to speed up these next few slides because I know it's almost eight o'clock and that's when it ends and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. But um, the town is also involved in monarch conservation. Um, it, I don't know what if everyone knows, but there's migratory populations of monarch butterflies. There's one in the eastern, the, the central and eastern U.S., which is called the um, eastern population. And then there's a western population, which migrates in California. So obviously the one here is the eastern population. Um, it's declined over 80 percent in the past two decades, mostly due to habitat loss and pesticide use. Um, the town has taken the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, uh, where we have committed to taking actions to help monarchs and other pollinators, um, like public outreach, like this presentation right now, <laughs> increasing monarch habitat, um, like by planting pollinator gardens, and we also participate um, 
and community science research as well. So um, one of the projects is the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, um, where you basically can count the, the monarchs that you have in, in your patch of milkweed. So we do this each year. You can also participate in this. Um, it's a really fun project to do with kids. They have, you know, if you want to do like a simple project with them, they have a, a simpler data sheet that you could do. It's fun to look for them and do it with kids or if you're a teacher with your class or something like that. And I'll give you a link to that later. Um, these are just some of the town's pollinator gardens that we've planted over the years. Um, Clark, this is its pollinator garden. We also have a rain garden with native plants. Um, this is one of the gardens at Gary Park. We have multiple pollinator gardens there. This is at Whitney and actually we planted two um, parking lot medians last year. Now we also have some at Martin Reed Park and um, the Yes We Can Center in Westbury and Pushillo Park in Carl Place. So ways you can help pollinators, um, again, plant native plants, including trees, um, remove invasive plants. Um, invasive species are those that are not native and they also cause harm. Um, so they outcompete native plants. There's not, they're not as beneficial or at all helpful to native pollinators and other wildlife. And some common examples that people still, I still see on people's properties today or people who still use them, um, mugwort, which I don't think anybody intends to use, um, porcelain berry, burning bush is a big one, um, Norway maple, tree of heaven, um, Japanese barberry and butterfly bush. A lot of people use butterfly bush, but it is an invasive plant. Um, it, it's not a host plant for any butterfly and it, um, its nectar is supposed to not be very nutritious for butterflies as well. So there are better, better choices than that. Um, you can also reduce pesticides, um, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides are all pesticides. So they all have some kind of direct or indirect um, negative effect on insects and pollinators in your yard. So please try to avoid those when you can. Um, just also be aware that spraying for mosquitoes can kill other insects, including pollinators, and may harm birds which eat them. Um, the best way you can get rid of mosquitoes is to remove any standing water, like in bird baths or gutters and things like that. You can also use mosquito dunks if there's water you just can't get rid of. Um, you can buy those online or at a, at a garden center. They, they are very selective. They only kill mosquito larvae, so they, they shouldn't harm any other species. Um, another thing you could do is provide nesting areas. Many bees nest in hollow stems or in bare patches of ground. Um, a dead tree stump is helpful for carpenter bees that nest. Um, and you can leave cut perennial plant stems um, eight to 12 inches high, and that will help provide nesting for those cavity nesting bees. Um, you can reduce outdoor lighting. Um, artificial light can um, change normal behavior of insects and birds. And then um, I will talk, I, you can help participate in community science projects. There's other ones besides ones about monarchs, and I'll, I'll give you the link to that later. Um, providing resources for pollinators also helps other wildlife. Um, there's, you know, you have native plants and you provide these, these areas for pollinators, but that also provides insects for birds to eat, seeds for birds to eat, cover, nesting materials, um, and nesting areas, as well as beneficial predatory insects to help keep pests in check on your property. Um, one way you can help do that and is by taking the town's pollinator pledge. Um, any, anybody who maintains their property, res residents, businesses, schools, et cetera, can take the pledge. So please do and help help pollinators on your property. Um, the last topic I wanna to discuss very quickly um, is about more about capturing stormwater runoff. We already talked about rain barrels and native plants. So I'll just talk, a tiny bit about rain gardens. These are shallow depressions in the landscape that are used to capture stormwater from your gutter downspout or sloped area. So you can see in this picture, it kind of has like a bowl shape. It uses native plants. Um, so you're getting that wildlife habitat as well. 
Um, it filters the storm water. It helps replenish water in the aquifer. Um, this picture is actually of the shortly after planting Clark's rain garden, Clark, at Clark Botanic Garden. And if you're interested in learning more about rain gardens, you can take the rain garden class we have coming up in a few weeks. And then this is just one more way um, to help reduce stormwater runoff is to use pervious or permeable surfaces. So there's things called pervious concrete and pervious asphalt, which looks like this. And basically the rainwater can flow right through it. So it's not running off like a normal asphalt or concrete. Um, if you ever been to planting fields, Arboretum, their whole parking lot is, I think, pervious asphalt, which is pretty cool. And then there's also permeable pavers. So um, these pavers have, you know, some kind of space in between so that the water can flow through them. Okay, so that's it for info. Now I will just give you some, some last, our upcoming programs is if you didn't sign up yet, the Native Plant Gardening Workshop is March 15th at 6.30 p.m. And then the Workshop on Rain Gardens is uh, March 29th at 6.30 p.m. Um, and they'll, they'll be held just like this on Zoom and they're free and open to anyone interested. And then we have our Rain Barrel Composter Sales coming up this month. I can't believe it's already March. Um, the Rain Barrel and Composter are both $50 each. Um, they're for residents only, Town of North Hempstead residents only. You will have to show an ID when you're there. Um, it's one each per household. And we're doing it on a first come, first serve basis. And we have a limited number. So if you want one, try to get there. The sooner, the better. Um, we're having the March 24th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and the March 25th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Clark Botanic Garden. And if you can't get one this time, you can't make it, or you just, you know, we run out, we will be having another um, set of sales uh, later on in the next month or two. Um, here's resources. Um, these are a lot of things I mentioned as as I was going through the presentation. So be good. I mean, you can you can see this presentation online later, but if you wanna just take a snapshot with your phone, it's a good thing to have. Um, I'll go, I'll go back to it, but I just wanna say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, a very special thanks to Bonnie as well. Um, we hope you learned a lot and took away some different ways that you can landscape your yard in a more sustainable way. And um, this is my email. So like I said, if you wanted to be notified of the Native Plant Rebate Program, or if you have any other questions later that you think of, you can always email me. Um, and I'll, I'll put that in the chat too, but I'm gonna go back to this. So if anybody wants to look, and then I'm gonna go back to the chat so I can see if there's some more questions. Okay, so someone wants to know what's a good high traffic grass? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I don't know if you meant like, like the low mow grass or yeah, most lawn grasses are good for high traffic. Um, so I don't know if you want to clarify that question. Maybe I can answer it after. Um, Pennsylvania sedge does flourish in shade. It actually does better in shade than it does in full sun. So, so it's like a lot of lawn grasses don't grow in the shade that well. It's great. It's a, it's a great alternative. Um, can you touch base a, a bit on the differences between native wild strawberry versus the invasive fall strawberry? Yellow flower, something to look out. Yes, you're right. Um, I do see those false. There's there's also a, a barren strawberry, which is a native plant. Um, I don't know if that's what you mean or if you're talking about that other one that I always see growing in my yard <laughs> that I don't want. Um, but I know the um, the one that I'm thinking of is has very hairy stems, and yeah, that's that's not the native strawberry. The native strawberry has um, runners, and you'll see them. They kind of like they don't have like an underground rhizome that spreads. You can see it kind of like going across the soil, so you can see it growing that way. Um, and like you said, it has the, it has white flowers with a yellow center. So they're definitely different from those other ones. And then there's also barren strawberry, which I, it's not really a strawberry because it doesn't have strawberries, but um, 
it is also a good ground cover. So, but it has, that has yellow flowers, but it also is a native plant. So, um, do you have any tips, advice on how to keep wasps away from a picnic area? Does putting a dish of sugar water away from your table work to attract wasps away? Um, I'm, I've never had much luck <laughs> with trying to keep them away. Um, it's usually wasps and bees. It's at the end of the season when their numbers get really big um, in the nest. So they're all kind of out there looking for more food. Um, and they get very much attracted to, you know, whatever we're eating and drinking. Uh, Bonnie, have you had any luck with uh, keeping wasps away while you were eating outside? Um, I did plug in a fan to keep like mosquitoes and wasps away from where we were having like a barbecue outside and, and that, you know, they don't like that movement of air. Um, I don't know if that's <laughs> something everyone can do, but I had a, I just had a fan in the house. I plugged it in and sort of faced it towards everybody and that sort of helps. But again, you're right. It's at the end of the season that you would get the, it's usually the yellow jackets that, that um, are coming towards the end of the season. And they're going after anything, anything sweet, any meat. They go after everything. Um, so it's sometimes it's difficult. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. You can get some one of those, you know, oscillating fans and kind of just put it toward where you're eating. Um, I think that's it. Some people said thank you, which I, I appreciate. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. Um, and sorry, we took a little bit extra time than we um, intended, but we appreciate you sticking around, those of you that did. And um, if you did it, this will be again posted online so that you can um, see the recording and anything you missed. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Ha happy planting. Good luck. And hope maybe we'll see you at the other classes later this month. Have a great season.